Um, I think I should start out with a little disclaimer here today, <laughs> uh, because we've already heard a lot about open data and open access and the politics behind it and the risk assessment of it. And what I'd like to talk about today is is not so much should you put your data out there or shouldn't you and, and things like that. It's more once you have put your data out there, you have made it available on the internet, what how can you make it more accessible for people like me, who are researchers who want to access the data and want to use it, reuse it in different applications in my own research. Um, and at this point I should also just say that I'm not coming from some big heritage data uh, institution. I'm just me as a private researcher. Well, I work for the project that I work for, but um, so from my point of view as a lone researcher, how do I get more out of all this data that we have on the Anyway, um, let's see how this works. So currently I'm working as a digital humanist and programmer at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich on the Buddhist manuscripts of Gandhara project. And uh, I'd like to begin the presentation today with a little dialogue that actually starts in a way that many of us are possibly familiar with this um, phrase. Is there? Is there between me and the world. Hello world. Hello you. Now why don't, oh, that didn't really work quite well. Why don't I put my data online and share it with you world? Great idea you. I'll of course do the same. <laughs> anyway, that's quite me. But um, the question is, and uh, this is a question in my title, can we share? Uh, and what quite <laughs> yeah well, yes uh, can we share well I'm not quite sure that we are there yet so this is why I propose this uh, <coughs> I pose this rhetorical question and what I mean by share is can I actually get access to your data in okay. no, it's not really <laughs> sorry. in our funding applications. We want to share and we want to make our data available to the whole world. Um, but are we actually sharing enabled yet? Um, it's just, as a researcher, I would like to, um, it's just not enough for me that I'm, I can go to your website and I can search through your data set, but I can't actually access it. I can't get it out in the format that I I can use for anything. I can't get it out uh, necessarily as something as simple as a, a comma separated versioning file or even something I'd really like to get is like a request for web service, so access to a URL. And I know today we've had some presentations showing all these neat things you can you can well you can access it like that. Um, I think what I'm looking at is more it's not so much sharing between big institutions and, and things like that, but how do we make this available to the lone researcher? So, in 2007, I researched data interoperability as a part of my MSc dissertation, which is called Heritage Portals and Cross-Border Data Cross -border Data Interoperability. And my conclusion back then was already, it could be better. Um, as a, I'll quote from the the dissertation. Other heritage portals have been demonstrated throughout the dissertation, coming to the conclusion that the most that most of them provide read-only access to users, even though the technology with which they were built could potentially allow more open access. But this is of course a few years ago, so I was hoping to um, to follow this up with a little research example. 
and it's very traditional research of a hypothesis and a test and a conclusion. Work on the screen, okay. Um, so for the test, I've chosen the subject of a post and and um, this is simply because actually I I once found a post and I really I really like them and. Um, so I decided to, to kind of go on the internet, very basic, look at what is a post and how can I find information about a post and if this is what I wanted to research. So I'm just quickly introduce post up to you. It's a bronze axe or chisel. And it can look like this. Um, actually, at the time where I found it, uh, in a field somewhere in Britain, I was already very much into data, so uh, I was probably one of the few people on the project who wasn't really in archaeology for the gold or the bronze or things like that. So I was a bit, okay, I found this post down, and everyone was really <laughs> jealous, and I was like, but it's not like data, you know. <laughs> but anyway, it's. So, anyway, it's very common in the mid bronze age in northern, western, and southwestern Europe. Yes, I did look this fact up on Wikipedia because I couldn't be bothered to go through my own old notes. So, so what do I do with this information? Um, I, I, the first thing I wanted to do was to try and find out more about the spread of posters. So I wanted to map data. So I decided to go looking for map data. Um, and I went to the wonderful Portable Antiquities Scheme where I could do a search, I could um, find a lot of post stamps across Britain. And the best thing about this is that if I signed up with them as a researcher, told them what I wanted to research and why, they said, okay, we'll give you access to the data. We'll give you a uh, KML um, export of the data so that you can open it up in Google Maps or wherever you want to do. We'll give you a CSV export too. And I really, I found this approach quite inspiring. I'm going to use it later on in my own um, work. So, so I got, from the uh, Portable Antiquity Scheme, I found uh, 335 results where the object type equals poster. And then I headed off to Sweden to look at their uh, FMIS form search, so their Site and Monuments Register. And here I find, found 35 mentions of Afsats Uksa, which is the switch post um, And here again I was able to export it as a KML file, which was really <laughs> great, this was going really well. <laughs> so, off to Denmark. Yes, so here I found 123 results. Well, actually, the first time I found 114 results, and the next time I found more and more, so they just seem to be adding more data there, which is cool. Um, then came the first stumbling point, basically. I couldn't export any data. There, was, um, there wasn't any map data available for you to see online, but I sure couldn't export anything. I couldn't even export it as a um, CSV or anything. So then I tried the Netherlands. In um, the member of the Netherlands database, I found 113 results for Bronze and B. Um, it was great, and I tried out the German. I tried to find stuff in Germany too, but actually there I stumbled across the, the fact I couldn't actually find an, uh, an actual collective archaeological database to, to search for this sort of thing. So at this point I kind of decided to cut my losses and stop looking for archaeological data sets on this. So if you are sitting out there thinking, why didn't you just look here, do come and tell me. I'd like to have a look. Wherever it is. Um, but I did get some spatial data collected that I could actually use. So, what did I do with it? I uploaded it to Google Maps and thought, cool, now I can see the spread of post apps across Europe, or across the UK and Sweden. <laughs> and, um, and actually, another thing that was quite cool was I thought, okay. Well, I know that there are some in Denmark, I know there are some in, in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, and I know that there are 
some in Germany too. I did find one data set uh, that has some pulse stamps. So I just put them in as, as points in Google Maps. And and that at least gives me some idea of the spread. And this, this map is available uh, publicly, so I'm going to go and check it out and put more stuff maybe if <laughs> you want. Anyway, um, so what else could I do with the data? Well, the Portal Antiquity Scheme allowed me to download the C, um, CSV file. So, so I could put it into my favorite spreadsheet program. Uh, and I could do some basic calculations. For example, the, the average weight of the post was 226 grams, and the average length is around 10 centimeters, which is nice to know, I guess. <laughs> but uh, at this point, I'd just like to take a, a minute to think about how wonderful it could have been if I'd been able to access this sort of data across Europe with a lot of different data sets and all the, how easy I could have researched this subject more thoroughly. Um, so on to the next research test, which is knitted socks. Yes. Um, now why knitted socks, you might be asked. Well, um, that's because I can knit them and I'm very interested in them, and so it's, it's research close to my, my heart and sometimes you really have to do that. Or oh, actually, it's close to my feet. So. <laughs> yeah. so I didn't want to repeat the first research test looking for spatial data. So I decided instead to look at images. And um, a quick Google search kind of told me that there is images of knitted socks in V&A collections. So I went there to have a look and searched for uh, knit socks and received 156 results. 56 of them which actually had images. And, um, and now that we're talking about images, um, first of all, let me mention that VNA actually have a very detailed image reuse policy, which is quite a cool thing. And sometimes they don't quite think about people like bloggers, or at least they don't want to say anything specifically about bloggers and what can they use the images. Um, it's more like you can use it for research or personal research or. You know, if you want to use it commercially, you have to pay. Yes, but yeah, <laughs> the in-betweens. Um, but anyway, on the subject of images, I also had a look at Flickr's, the Commons, and the Media Commons for knit sock images, and did receive a few results, like this nice one here of the Red Cross women knitting socks for soldiers in World War One. This is from the State Library of New South Wales. And it's an image I probably never would have found if it wasn't for the fact that they put it on uh, Flickr's Commons because I never would have gone to their collections and looked separately through their collection for knit socks. So, um, so how do you... What I actually wanted to discuss was not so much what can you do with the images, because people don't think of that, but well, how do you get access to these images, to the searches for these images? And for that, Flickr is really quite cool in that they have the nice um, API Explorer, which allows you to, to create the API, um, or create the, the URL, to get the live feed version of a search or, um, or any sort of information about their images. So for this example, I used the method flickr.photos.search to, to search for um, text equals knit socks and in commons equals yes. And I get the resulting uh, list of images as XML. I promise, this is the only picture of XML. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, um, and XML is great, you know, it's, yeah. It is human readable, it is. <laughs> um, so, the, well, what I wanted to say here was it's not about getting the XML for the sake of the XML, however much I do like XML. It's about getting the live access, uh, the access to the live feed of this data. And uh, they also have other ways of, uh, other formats, JSON and, yeah. Um, so to say that I wanted to reuse this list of images on, on my blog, for example, I could, um, when I do, so because of it, because it's a web service, 
it will automatically update the list. If someone puts in a new image with lit socks, it will automatically update it um, on my, my blog post. So here's an example of on my blog I've taken, I've used the, the a Flickr uh, a plugin for my blog, a Flickr photo viewer, which actually uses the web service too. So if I went in and added more photos to this collection on Flickr, it would automatically be updated on my blog, which is cool. Um, so that was just basically an explanation for how do you use this data if if you're not familiar with XML, if XML just, okay, I don't know what that says, then you can use it in, with different plugins like this, and I think there'll be more and more of this sort of thing um, in the future. And if you are familiar with XML and XSLT, well, then you know what to do with it. So. Uh, finally, I just wanted to quickly talk about text, which is the thing I'm doing at the moment. Um, so I'm, I would like to quickly search through some historic documents that mention knitted socks. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that I'm going to cheat a little bit here because I already know where I'm going to go looking. I'm going to go to the Vindolanda tablets online uh, and look at a quite well-known referenced knitted sock in a historic document. So I go to their, their index searcher and I search for the, the word Udo for socks and I get the, the tablet uh, 346 that we see here. Um, but actually, in reality, it doesn't actually say knitted socks. Zoom in, it just says socks. It's a bit of a cheater. But actually, a rumor does go around the internet that it says knitted socks. But just goes to show. Um, but the Vindolanda tab is online. Um, it does actually use web services for the whole website. Um, so the web, I know this because I, I built it. So the web service is used both to build a website and is served out so other people can access it and, and use it, which I think is a good example of, of using, not just making the web service for others to use, because that's not really, um, we probably don't have money to, to do that sort of thing, but maybe integrate it as a way of how developing the, the web, the publication of your data, and then open it up to others too. So today I'm just going to quickly round off with what I'm doing right now. Uh, this is with the Gandhara manuscripts. Um, yeah. So with this I'm doing similar work that I was doing on the Vindolanda tablets, that we, in the sense that we like to republish the Buddhist manuscripts through TEI XML, which of course will give us the added benefits that we can do some things like link, links between the text and the images. For example, with this part, it says uh, Buddha-san here, and uh, we'd like to be able to link this part of the image specifically to a part of the, the text uh, in XML. So, um, other things we'd like to do is index searching and <coughs> interoperability between the manuscripts in the publication itself. So, and on top of this, we would like to um, create a new editing environment that will enable the scholars who read these texts and who are spread out all over the world to edit the text collaboratively within the system. And last but not least, we'd also like to try um, to think ahead and figure out how this data set can be reused in the future by other researchers and, and other projects. Because the text will be uh, marked up as TEI XML. So interoperability in that sense will be secured to an extent. Um, but I think it's quite important also to, to consider how can other people in the future use this data set and um, not just how can they download all the XML and, and do something with it, but how can they get access to, to searching it and, um, yeah, on different levels. So I'm kind of hoping to, to develop the system with web services in mind, because in that sense, I can sit and do a publication view of it for the online, for people who want to view it online, um, but other people could do an app for a tablet, 
for example, with it. Uh, we could do an editing environment that's on a tablet or uh, on a desktop, or but using the same data and the same um, web services that we've already developed. So, so. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me on this little research journey today. And uh, I actually, I promised my, uh, my colleague, Andrea, when I made her sit through the presentation <laughs> earlier, that I would conclude by telling you exactly what it is I want from your data, because she was like, oh, so, so if we make it XML, then that's fine. And I'm like, as much as I love XML, no, that's not quite enough. Um, it needs to be, well, I, I prefer if it is accessible as live feeds with adjustable URLs, uh, or at least, like in the portable integrity scheme, uh, an export option for, for custom searches. So, now the tests that I've done today, or the sort of appendixes for this, are going to be available on my blog with links to everything. And please feel free to catch me and comment on it, or give me ideas for other places I could go and search. And I know there's a lot of data sets out there that are trying to make these things available and possibly already have. Um, but because I chose specific things to research, I probably haven't gotten to them in this round, and, but I'd love to know about them. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Henriette?